Hi. Hello, sir. Uh-huh. Also, it's unavoidable the use use of addressing each other, sir and madam. Huh? <laughs> it will be too impolite if you don't use it. It's very oh. important in, in this part. Oh, very impolite. Yeah. Very impolite. Very important. Okay, it's different from that. Okay. So I have to accept that. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's a little uh, early, so hopefully I won't fall fall asleep doing this. <laughs> There is a small introductory session, which we'll begin in a minute. Then we can start with your presentation. Well, turn the light in the back. Okay. Oh. So we can uh, we can take questions for about uh, we can take about five to ten questions now after the session. Are you are you talking to me? Uh, What's that? Uh, yes, Kim. So can we take? Hmm? Uh, the talk will be about 40 minutes, assume, 40 minutes around. OK, so we're we're starting in 30 minutes, right? No, we'll be starting, we'll be starting right now with that small introductory session, which will be around only 5 to 10 minutes. We can straight away start. Oh, so we're starting now? we we'll start now. OK. Can you start? Okay. Would you? Yes. Good evening, uh, one and all. You joined us for the second session of Hallyu Namaste, an international digital seminar organized by the postgraduate department. Research, Vesalius College Kottayam, in collaboration with MG University Kottayam and IQC Vesalius College and Inco Center Chennai. We had an inaugural session in the morning and Dr. Leda Nair gave the inaugural address. We also had three paper presentation sessions in the afternoon. This session's keynote address is by Professor Kion Kim. This session is live streamed in YouTube as well. So without further ado, let us begin the session. Uh, with the welcoming words of Professor Elsa C. Maria Sebastian, the head of our Department of English, uh, I invite our dear Elsa Miss to welcome the gathering. Thank you, Viju. Good morning, Dr. King. And a very good evening to everyone else on the other side of the globe. Welcome to the third session of the international seminar, Hallyu Namaste. Korean Waves on Indian Shore, organized by the Department of English, Vasilis College, Kottayam. Earlier today, we had the inaugural session, as Dr. Viju said, uh, by Dr. Letha Nair R, and uh, a second session of paper presentations held both online and offline. As we roll on to the third session, I'm very glad to welcome and introduce the keynote speaker, Professor Kyung Hyun Kim, Professor of East Asian and Visual Studies at the University of California, Irvine. He's also a creative writer, a film producer, and a scholar. He's the author of Virtual Hallyu, Korean Cinema of the Global Era, The Remasculinization of Korean Cinema, Hegemonic Mimicry, Korean Popular Culture of the 21st Century, all published by Duke University Press and a Korean language novel titled In Search of Lost G. He has also co-produced and co-scripted two award-winning feature films, Never Forever, which won Sundance Film Festival's US main competition in 2007, and The Housemaid in Cannes Film Festival in 2010, and co-scripted a film screenplay 
the origins of a detective which won a cash prize of uh, 30,000 US dollars on being selected for the 2019 Best Film Development Project by the Korean Film Commission. His first theatre screenplay is titled The Mask Debate, which was premiered in February 2021 uh, through UCI's Illuminations Chancellor's <coughs> Initiative in Arts and Drama YouTube channel. His topic for today's uh, keynote address is titled Of Mimicry and Migu, Opaquely Racial, Ambivalently Hegemonic. On behalf of all of us, I warmly welcome you, sir, to this session. I also welcome all the participants, presenters, my colleagues in the Department of English and also other departments, my dear students, both abroad and in town, who have joined us online for this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for uh, Kavira. Yes, yes. Uh, we say to be the first person. Uh, thank you, Elena, for that warm words of welcome. For the benefit of all the participants here, we are very extremely glad to have Dr. King King King, Professor East Asian Studies, Visual Studies, School of Humanities, University of California, Irving with us today for the keynote address. Professor Kim is a very known name amongst the academicians who follow the recent global success of foreign popular culture, which is also the Hallyu. He theorizes the developments in Hallyu and, is, and its global proliferation and sees this wave from a trans and transcultural perspective. Helps as I actually right now rightly said, bear testimonies of his research and academic interest in this area. And the three books published so far, The Virtual Hue, The Remasculation of Foreign Cinema, and the latest, The Hegemonic Mimicry, he presents the much needed update on today's subcorporate culture, the most fascinating epicenters of global cultural flows. His latest book, Hegemonic mimicry has been well appreciated for offering a probing insight into the wide spectrum of media productions. As we had already stated in the brochure, Dr. Kim is not only known for critical pieces, but he's also known for his creative uh, enterprises. We have posted the link to his YouTube film in the show itself. Hopefully, all of you will have watched it. Through his book, uh, he effectively provides insightful critical analysis of Korean cultural products, and they are explored through a variety of lenses. And he is elaborated as to how commercialization of pop Korean popular culture has appended the familiar dynamic of minor to major, major to minor cultural influence, enabling Hallyu to become one of the most dominant global cultural phenomena. I cannot give a better description than what. So Kim Kim rightly puts, he captures the symptomatic signs of the new millennium. Uh, don't, uh, this is for the benefit of all the participants here. We have we've been extremely to have such a resourceful resource with us here to speak very authoritatively in this area. Over to you, Professor Kim, for your address. Okay. Thank thank you. Uh, Kavita for that wonderful um, introduction. Uh, I feel as if uh, there's no uh, other way uh, to go but to go down, yeah, from from here. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will uh, uh, be reading um, uh, from uh, uh, from you know part of my manuscript uh, that I've actually tried to modify uh, uh, for this uh, keynote address. Uh, you know, I feel um, things that I, my book just came out, uh, The Money Mimicry, um, and uh, I know the title is a little bit uh, too academic, maybe, you know, as you probably think, what the hell is 
opaquely racial and ambivalently hegemonic, right? Uh, if it's hegemonic, it should be just absolutely hegemonic rather than ambivalently hegemonic. And then there is racial, um, you know, the recognition of a racial element within within what I think, uh, what I try to conceptualize around the uh, idea of, of Hallyu. Uh, you know, Hallyu is supposed to be I think in some ways, uh, non-signifying racial kind of, yes, it's about Korea and it's about Koreans performing uh, popular culture uh, and popular music and, and so on and so forth. But in many ways, it doesn't accentuate race, right? Um, and so why is it that I've got racial and then opaquely racial, you know, <laughs> uh, to connote a certain kind of recognition of, of race, uh, and I wanted us to maybe think about this a little bit. Um, and and hence my title, um, you know, which is convoluted, admittedly, uh, opaquely racial and ambivalently hegemonic. So um, let me uh, let me go through this uh, I've prepared, and then um, hopefully you might have some questions. Um, uh, from the audience, uh, which I'll be happy to entertain. Hopefully, uh, the audio wasn't wasn't too good, and so I will uh, after uh, I finish my you know speech or lecture, uh, I will try to get a, a headset and you know uh, try to listen in. Okay, uh, for those of you who may have questions, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Okay, you can. Yes. Yes. yes sir. Okay. No, okay. Good. Um, so, uh, this is uh, how I'm going to begin. Imagine a where American cities have been de devastated and slummified after a long decade of economic depression and total war. Large number of young people are missing, dead, badly wounded. Survivors, mostly women, children, and the old, are forced to pull themselves together from ruins of concrete slabs, metal scraps, and war ashes. Separation. The foreign army that has defended these American cities is asked by a humiliating leader to remain and help reserve. Let's just say that the foreign army that has been asked to save these American stories come from a country across the Pacific. Korea. They speak only Korean, so the foreign army has now come to America. Um, that is the Korean army. They speak only Korean, eat Korean food, and socialize among themselves. Because tens of thousands of Korean lives have been sacrificed to defend American soil. Once the war has ended, their rest and recreation, or R, it is called in, in American military terms, R&R, &R, is given priority by the American leader. Koreans occupy the best hotels downtown and hold auditions for local singers, musicians, dancers, and vodka type matching and freak shows. Because talented young American women and men now desperately need work to survive the post war devastation, they audition before panels of Korean right, military officers who come to occupy America. Because the Korean soldiers prefer to watch female singers perform on stage, American girls frantically learn the musical scores and lyrics of Korean folk songs on the fly. Korean traditional melodies registering in the moody minor pentatonic scale sound foreign to young American ears and are almost impossible to learn because the lyrics are in a language that sounds nothing like any of the more familiar Indo-European languages that they have heard before, let alone English. Yet, because the income generated from each week of work is easily three or four times the income earned from working at any local farm, you desperately audition for the Koreans, even though you have heard horror stories about long bus rides on the unpaved roads about the sex deprived soldiers who will grope you on stage and later will whisk you away to Korea. 
because your performance is evaluated by Korean military officers who serve as judges. You force yourself to learn new songs by transliterating the lyrics into the English alphabet, even though the Korean words make no sense to you. You may pass the first audition, but even when you succeed in touring on stage for a couple of months, you must continue to compete against newer and younger faces who try to take your place every change of season. Each audition requires you to learn the new hit songs on the radio, mimicking the accent and intonation of each and every Korean word is almost painful physically because you have to use different facial muscles to pronounce iotized vowels such as ya, which is very common in Korea, or yo, and the frequent syllabic assembly of phonemes with preceding consonants of n or k, so makes it nya or kya, and psychologically because which is you know unavailable in the english again this kind of pronunciation and psychologically because korean soldiers constantly mock you for each pigeon diction you make just when you think you have mastered standard korean a new wave of hit songs with beats sung in non-standard korean come in vogue the new korean songs are recorded in a regional dialect which is much more difficult to learn than the songs sung in standard dialect. But you never lose hope. Soon you'll tell yourself that you can fulfill your dream of singing in front of real Korean audience back in Korea on a beautiful stage in the poshest, most exclusive neighborhood. Let's just say that is Gangnam. You must learn each and every song with a sincere and positive attitude, or else you may not pass the con constant test, get kicked off the tour, and lose your livelihood. Now, I begin my talk with the sketch of a scene from what looks like um, speculative fiction, which is, you know, science fiction, because not only does this hypothetical reversal of a hierarchical, hegemonic cultural imperialism sound horrifying for Americans, but this fictive representation also pointedly decenters what I believe uh, is to be regimes of representation prevalent throughout the 20th century that have heavily prioritized an American-centric axis while devaluing the peripheries of any culture, nation, or history that is non-American. Now, flip the Korean with American in the previous description, and you get a snapshot of what actually took place during the post-war years in Korea before the hate before the heyday of Shodan, uh, it, it was it was called Show Troops, um, uh, army of uh, uh, Korean entertainers performing the before the U.S. Uh, you know military Eighth Army that was stationed in Korea and continues to do so. Uh, came to an end with the intensification of Vietnam War. So during the fifties and sixties, for two decades, uh, this was what actually took place. If you switch Korean with American, the description that I had just now. Although the US of the 21st century now, over the last 20, 20 years, now espouses more political sensitivity around issue of race, this was much less true of the US of the mid 20th century. When the US military entered the Korean War, you know, from 1950 to 1953, then remained there to defend Korea from further communist aggression. America was still a racially segregated nation whose values, cultural identity, and historical determination to bring world peace was cultivated very much in the parlor of ideologies of white racial superiority. The treatment in many other parts of the world of non-white races along with their cultural identities and languages as equal to that of white America was at the time unthinkable. The elimination of racial inequality between blacks and whites was only in the infancy of discussion and still far from reality during the Korean War and its subsequent decade. Despite the fact that black only troops uh, were faced out during the Korean War by then President uh, of the U.S., Harry Truman, 
Racial discrimination and segregation remain entrenched in the barracks and social life and in civilian life back home. Well, until the early 1970s, camp town clubs for US military personnel in Korea were segregated, so much so that race riots took place in several of the clubs near Camp Humphreys, which is uh, now uh, part of Korea in Pyeongtaek, uh, by blacks were upset by the de facto policies of segregation by these clubs and their prior, uh, proprietors to separate entertainers and prostitutes who service white soldiers from those that service their black counterparts. So a lot of race riots, although Korea never really had a race problem uh, in the 1960s and 70s, um, took place in Korea because black soldiers were fighting against white soldiers uh, in American camp towns, uh, Korean camp towns, in, you know, uh, American camp towns in Korea. As a country, Korea held a strategic geopolitical significance for US policymakers, but the Koreans themselves were just the native people who happened to inhabit a that did not and could not figure into discussion uh, for racial inequality, a racial equality. For US politicians, Korea, as it remains largely unchanged today, has always had more importance. Again, I, I state this, is, is, uh, it still remains true, even though Korea obviously has now, um, you know, far bigger economic importance and cultural importance than ever before. For U.S. politicians, however, Korea remains more important as a bulwark against communism than for the people who inhabit it. Um, in the year 2022, which is what we got now, uh, more than 70 years after the war in Korea, this, this segregated blacks from Koreans, uh, blacks from whites for the first time in American history, while making permanent the division of Korean Peninsula along the 38th parallel, which is the DMZ that divides North Korea from South Korea. A Korean minjok, minjok is a, a Korean term um, that stands for, you know, national, both uh, national and ethnic, ethnic, ethnic uh, um, group in uh, uh, Korea, of Korean. Identity is rarely understood beyond the geopolitical significance that it has represented for the past three quarters of a century and its economic value to the world's finances and trade. That is, you know, maybe until now, right? It took place several generations for Korean identity to become, again, fully engaged in the act of amusement and pleasure through its buoyant uh, cultural renaissance that is called Hallyu because refiguration of a new subjectivity under a tightly linked rubric of capitalist expansion under the auspices of American-led order inevitably, inevitably took time. So what has happened is you had incubation of a very much of a pro-American, right, cultural sensitivity through the uh, emergence of Shodan period, right, show troops, of uh 1950s and 60s and my argument is it took 60 years yeah uh for <clears throat> that to actually cultivate and blossom into what is called how you today um <clears throat> though it is difficult and this is the irony is it is difficult to compare um such audition programs of local towns held in Seoul, and, and they definitely did took place, take place in every major Korean talent of 1950s, almost every major Korean talent of 1950s and 1960s went through the audition programs that were held by US military personnel, okay? Um, that was how, how pervasive and ubiquitous and widespread this was. Um, the entertainment, again, uh, westernized entertainment uh, form really took shape under the auspices of, of US military, yeah, in Korea. Um, though it is difficult to compare the addition programs of local talents held in Seoul during the post-war period to, to the public 
uh, slave, slave auctions held in the U.S. in the 19th century, what I have proposed in my study uh, is that South Koreans had to undergo a kind of transformation that included a process of what I believe a post-colonial uh, critic, Ashil Membi, has described as, quote, exclusion, brutalization, and degrada degradation, unquote, that despised and dishonored his or her own indigenous form and spirit in order to be given a manifestation of a cultural rebirth that has become fungible norm of the 21st century that has expanded into the entire planet of what I call um, following again, Mambi, becoming black of the world. Yeah? And, and here, when I say becoming black, I uh, think about maybe the positive aspects okay, of, of perhaps becoming black. The Korean subjectivity, in other words, which has been cultivated out of this very minjo, has been more aligned, in my view, um, more aligned with an ethnic distinction of the Korean people who occupy the Korean Peninsula at a time when you suffer from first before the Korean War, Japanese colonial rule and their descendants, rather than the one that is defined by a modern national citizenship of Korea and has rarely been, been given any kind of notice in America. The early sketch that I talked about of foreign military personnel uh, sponsored uh, additions for local entertainers directly showcase um, what Foucault had described as biopolitics that were established through a new mechanism of power that exerted a control apparatus over a large population of local entertainers that could be whimsically replaced, dismissed, and disposed. In other words, highlighting the tug of war between authenticity and imitation, the early history of Korean popular culture was this deep embeddedness by politics where Koreans were asked to produce endless chain of supply of disposable bodies of non-white entertainers that were regulated with total white American control. Now, despite these uneven and erratic historical developments, Korean identity as a new postmodern now enterprise creeping into the lives of American youth today through its enormously seductive music videos and alluring television dramas like the Squid Game, which draw enormous attention and numbers of likes in the global social media scene, while dominating new culinary and fashion trends. And so the previously intractable uh, Korean identity that was steeped in the in, in anti-colonial resistant proto-ethnic Minjo identity has undergone another phase of transformation. Um, Minjo was a term again that came out uh, about 100 years ago when Korea was, you know, um, experiencing Japanese colonial uh, domination. When the historical and ethnic specificity of Korean nationhood has been rendered opaque, again, it has become um, not that readily transparent or visible, the, 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 the concept of, of racial identity of Korea yeah. um, today, which has allowed, and that's that has allowed Korean pop music, comedies, dramas, films, and food to flow into the everyday lives of young people living outside Korea. When Korean entertainers first picked up their electronic guitars and sang into the microphones in order to sell their talent to Americans, um, their minjo identity had to be compromised. It wasn't just today, but it started in the 1950s when they started having additions for the U.S. military personnel. Um, Koreans continued their export initiative driven production of music videos that is largely repressed and suppressed their ethnic identity. The several decade old pursuit of a musical uh, non-national, so it's, it's actually 
erasure of of Minjo identity, or maybe adopting a pseudo American one, has indeed manufactured success. That is probably, if you look at it all around the world, unprecedented. K pop is the most musical, popular, one of the most music, popular musical genres uh, available in the world today. Now, the ironic effect is quite evident when. Korean now, you know, entertainment companies, SM, YG, and so on, big hit, hold auditions to select their new trainees. And, and you know, uh, as you probably all know, um, it's built on a training system, right? You can't just be a star in the Korean system. You have to go through auditions. Um, many young you know, wannabe singers, dancers, and talents from all over the world make their pilgrimage now to to Seoul. Um, and my friend runs an Airbnb in 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 in, uh, in Seoul, and um, and he's a uh, his many of his clients come all over from the world to uh, to actually hold it. You know, to to try out for these auditions that you know Korean uh, entertainment companies host. Um, the young tryouts are sometimes asked to perform before their Korean judges only, and this is the irony, only a few miles away from Yongsan. Um, the very spot, this is Yongsan is also a district in Seoul, the very spot where the auditions were held for Koreans to entertain the occupying American military personnel, you know, 50 years ago. These days, despite the recent um, diplomatic and economic war brewing between South Korea and Japan. Many young Korean talents, some of them established plot, uh, stars in their own country, learn new songs in Korean, so they now have to, they're, you know, uh, people outside Korea, the people are trying out for these auditions. Um, just like Koreans um, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, had to learn English, you know, to try out for the uh, additions in American military bases. Um, they're now the ones that are learning new songs in Korean to compete against the local Korean talents. The putatively post-ethnic rendering of Korean language, customs, rhythm, beats, and themes has permitted these cultural products aestheticized, performed, and enacted by Koreans in the 21st century to reach a quasi uh, global and what I call ambivalently hegemonic status. So I call the hegemonic status of K-pop, K-cinema, Hallyu directly linked the ways in which Koreans had to, you know, um, uh, had to render their ethnic origin to be opaque, less visible over the last several generations. Okay, this is this is what I like to see, what I like to argue, uh, how uh, the process of uh, Hallyu had uh, germinated itself originally. Now, um, my term uh, mimicry is derived from Homi K. Baba's seminal article uh, of mimicry in men and the ambivalence of colonial discourse, where he argued that the colonial subject is a product of a reformed, recognizable other as a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite, unquote. Um, the globalization that took place during the post World War II years had nothing to do had had to do uh, with a new form of mass culture, constructed under the rubric of undeniably American identity. But whether American cultural artifacts, styles, and pop products remain the same after Koreans learned them as their own America, Miguk. Um, that's the Korean word actually for the United States, which is derived from two Chinese characters. That is me, um, beautiful, and then guk uh, means country uh, in both Chinese and, and, and Korean. Uh, in Chinese, it would be meiguo. Uh, in Korean, it's miguk. 
um, or not is undebatable. Between the source, the source is obviously America, and the Korean quotation, Miguk, you know, so here is original America, and here is Miguk, right? Korean uh, quotation of, of uh, cultural, you know, signification of America. Between the two, I say a slippage and misappropriation were undeniably interjected, despite the best efforts by Koreans, you know, for over the past, you know, again, three quarter of a century to replicate the American performances. The simultaneous appropriation and sometimes even misappropriation and misquotation opened the door for innovation. And this is what I find to be an uh, interesting kind of, again, uh, creative process that took place, even though, yes, it was uh, largely a mimicry, it was largely copying, it was largely, you know, um, uh, appropriation, but every step of the way, there did remain a little bit of a door for innovation that did take place over the last 75 years. An innovation that was fraught with an appreciation of imitation and fakery that framed the everyday life of many Korean artists who could not even understand the language and gestures of American standard models. But nevertheless, that called for a new cultural condition that transformed the Korean popular sentiments. And over, over time, again, the mimicry of, of, of Americans, although you didn't necessarily understand the language and, and cultural, again, innuendos uh, that was part of this cultural right performances, you begin to not, after years and years of, again, trying to replicate and trying to, again, best approximate, right, the American performances, you not only become very good at it, but it begins to transform also, right? When your best, you know, cultural talent is the ones that have to mimic Americans, after several generations, it has a way of transforming the entire, again, um, popular language and popular sentiment and the popular culture of Korea as well. Because that's what the set standard of good now becomes. Uh, for better or for worse, right? And probably for better because, again, um, the world, the entire world is caught up in, um, you know, Pax Americana, which is, you know, American cultural domination is not only um, something that, that took place in America, uh, in Korea, but worldwide over the last, you know, good century or so. There was, however, this is probably the difference between Korea and the rest of the world. There was probably no other place in, in the era of Pax Americana outside the U.S. where the learning of the American, the aesthetic styles in English, was as intense and durable uh, as it was in Korea over the last 75 years. I mean, you know, you can argue and say, yes, there are places like Okinawa, Japan. Uh, there's Frankfurt in, in Germany because of a large American military presence and cultural presence, you, you had those places uh, become affected and influenced. But, um, you know, as I argue, and I try to, if anybody has questions um, about the American Forces uh, Network television um, and the ways in which it, it, was, it was very persuade, uh, pervasive and, and ubiquitous in, in Korea, I'll, I'll be able to happy to go over that. But, um, nowhere was it as intense, uh, the American presence, militarily, uh, culturally, and, and otherwise, than it was in South Korea over the last 75 years, as, as far as I could tell. Even though, you know, Frankfurt and Okinawa are, you know, very close um, in terms of, again, uh, is, uh, is influence, the American influence. Um, <clears throat> now, um, Koreans learned to, uh, throughout the last 75s, enact a two-step, um, what I call double gesture of 
both mimicking, so it's, it's a double gesture that, that I feel is very important in the process of mimicry, mimicking as well as innovating, uh, which immersed its own, uh, you know, articulation of miguk, right, America, um, and the Korean movements, rhythm and language. The process of then miguification, I, I just uh, came up with that word, Americanization or miguification, both weakened and intensified the Korean emotions and soul, which for many decades ended up playing hide and seek with American, uh, with Korea's survival acts of mimicry. Thus, one can argue that South Korea has exploited a close uh, social political alliance with the U.S. over the past several decades that produced a simulation of American a conceptional culture, one that decoded and, I go back to this phrase again, rendered opaque the local Korean minjo identity before it began circulating through global social media. <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, shoot this um, Okay, so hopefully you will, uh, are able to see this. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, and, and this is a, a real uh, photo from the audition days, um, the shodan day, what I call the shodan days, the show troop days, uh, where Korean, the top Korean entertainers uh, had to perform for the American military uh, personnel, and this is uh, one of the uh, very popular girl group, uh, you know, just like um, maybe Blackpink of today, you know, uh, of uh, of the day at time, 1960s, uh, a Korean um, a woman, uh, as you can see, um, a very beautiful, very attractive, um, you know, and very capable actually, and they became uh, big stars, uh, not only among uh, American military personnel, but uh, among uh, Korean general population uh, in the 1970s, after their uh, Shodan period had uh, uh, ran dry in the 60s, yeah? Um, and many of them, um, the, the Shodan performers ended up not only, uh, you know, uh, were they creative uh, in mimicking, you know, the American performances, but they ended up, you know, um, becoming the the pioneers of Korean popular music in the in the post war uh, decades, becoming the very composers, producers, uh, as well as talent managers. You know, in the, as when they retire from, um, you know, their their uh, when once their performing uh, age had uh, uh, had terminated, uh, they became um, very successful. Um, you know, again. Uh, producers uh, in the 80s and 90s that became the pre predecessor for the K-pop. Yeah, um, SM, you know, Isuman um, is uh, one of the last remaining generation of the uh, uh, Shodan period uh, of the 1970s. Yeah, and in some ways, um, YG um, of uh, you know he came out um, where. Um, uh, Sateji uh, was a rapper that was very popular in Yongsan in Taiwan, the American military base. You know, that's where they learned the trade of of of, uh, of rap and hip hop in the 1980s, uh, and would translate that success into the uh, Korean Korean pop scene in the 1990s. And then, you know, uh, he became um, a media module basically that uh, controls now Big Pink, uh, uh, Blackpink, and um, uh, what else? Uh, Big Bang that are uh, top um, K pop performers. 
Okay. Kavita, how much time do I have? Um, another 10, 10, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll try to wrap it up in, in 10 minutes. Um, and just, uh, skip the rest of the uh, lecture to deliver at the conclusion. So, so um, we're almost there. And thank you for staying on. Um, K-pop, K-cinema, and K-television have developed a cultural identity unique, but not totally dissimilar to that of the American hegemonic identity. In other words, the emergence of Korean popular culture in the 21st century today is an exemplary case of what I call an ambivalent act of mimicry, one that recalls uh, aforementioned, uh, the one that was previously mentioned by Baba as uh, almost the same, but not quite, right? Yes, uh, there is a similarity, but you know, not exactly, right? Whenever there is an act of mimicry logic. Uh, this Ambivalent act of mimicry in the form of appropriation parody and ultimately transformation proposes to be hegemonic in that it acknowledges both the power of rule and requires both coercion and, and consent. And I feel as if, you know, that it, it was both there. One was obviously, you know, um, uh, a survival tactic, one that had required um, Koreans in order to actually, you know, survive, you had to mimic the Americans, uh, because that's, that was the only place where they could actually, you know, provide a livelihood for, you know, talented Koreans, uh, the U.S. military shows, but also consent, you know, you, you had to accept and, and you had to also volunteer, you know, within the global sphere of U.S. dominated uh, mass culture in the form of pop music, Hollywood and entertainment show television, and also it was, it was a lot of fun, you know, uh, American music, uh, no doubt about it. Here, the Korean uh, K cultural industry, Hallyu, uh, served as a model, model. Um, that was an acknowledgement uh, and, in some ways, resistant, right, to the hegemonic powers of, of capitalist and global ambitions of Hollywood, the U.S. music industry, and other media industries. Um, that weakens the culture other yes it is, is is a way of you know american cultural hegemony had a way of in some ways in order to you know that's what that's what happens in order to actually become dominant in order to become hegemony you have to weaken the other but at the same time by weakening the other you are also you know legitimating in, in some ways another kind of form of innovation that is possible right another parody another version Koreans have nourished a system of popular culture that has rendered its own, and I, I, I say this again um, with a grain of salt, but, but it has taken place, right? We, nobody can deny that, that Hallyu is, has come and is here to stay, has rendered its own proto-ethnic and nationalist flavors um, that came about, that became opaque in order for it to survive in the face of global competition um, in, in the era of social media and American-led uh, media industry like Netflix and you know, um, Apple and so on. So the ambitions of cultural power for the Koreans settle for a milder and tamer version of Koreanness that is as deeply fried as his own recipe of yangnam chicken, which is Korean spiced chicken that was you know, and, and Korean, again, fried chicken, uh, we, we think, oh, it's, it's so Korean and it's so tasty and, and it's very uniquely. Well, not so much because at one point it was imported from the U.S., you know, and it was really um, what fried chicken is, uh, I think, uh, comes from African-American culture that traveled actually to Korea in the 1950s and 60s and, and Koreans started adding its own, right? Um, so can Koreans, after generations of close military, economic, cultural alliance, 
nation has formed with Americans, and I ask, attain more than the status of honorary American partner. Um, and I say this uh, almost cynically because I don't think, you know, uh, Americans, even today, will consider uh, South Koreans um, more than just a, you know, junior of the junior of the American partners. Can Koreans achieve the status of a true, again, American friendship with crossover sensibilities that diversify the very meaning of America, the ways in which African American culture is, has diversified the meaning of Korea, uh, American. So can Korean culture or how you not only emerge as a true presence of a legitimate, however opaquely, you know, nationalistic it is, achieve a sense of, again, global, global dominance, global recognition of some sort. Not only that, but can it actually transform what it means to be American, right? Um, by instituting its own migokification or migok, right? If all of the global cultural sensation of the past 75 years since the conclusion of World War II that were born outside of North, North America and Europe, such as Jamaican reggae, new American, Latin American cinema of the, uh, the, the uh, Central and, and, and South America, or India's Bollywood music have proven both an innovation mix of local brands of beats, edits, and footprints combined with dominant uh, pop structure of rock and roll and Hollywood films. The Korean brand of cinema compared to, again, uh, Jamaican reggae or India, India's Bollywood. Um, I feel the Korean brand of music uh, and television and cinema and so on and so forth over the last 20 years um, stands out as one that is falling short of innovatively uh, integrating the local flavor into its cultural output. Um, so, you know, I mean, I feel when you hear Jamaican reggae or about, you know, Bollywood music, I feel there's a lot more local than it is with, with K-pop. Instead, Korean popular culture has found its success, um, not accentuating it, but repressing and making, again, making opaque its own ethnic subject, ethnic and, and local subjectivity. In so doing, the ethnic diversity and consciousness that are often celebrated in the local aesthetic movements in Jamaica, Cuba, or India are not transparently evident in Korea. The Hallyu of the past 20 years may be the first time um, in some ways the East Asian Minjok has become a critical voice in the makeup of global pop culture that has leaped over the linguistic and cultural walls that surround the minor culture. Obviously, it's, I think it's a great achievement you know, um, largely, uh, uh, you know, overwhelming majority of K-pop is, despite the fact, you know, uh, BTS is um, number one singles in America, Dynamite and, um, you know, Butter were uh, sung entirely in, in English. Um, you know, it does retain uh, Korean language, yes, uh, which is minor language. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, there's no doubt uh, that this is a great achievement. But at the same time, it did have uh, its success by repressing, right, uh, the ethnic background and making it opaque. The opacity of ethnicity is precisely the reason the cake culture industry, industry can be considered in some ways both racialized and non-racialized. Um, and I play both ways. The fact that Koreans had to overcome traumas of an extended period of modern day uh, slavery during colonialism, and also uh, spectacular forms of uh, a nationwide disruption and trauma during the Cold War. You know, I mean, not only did it go through a, a Korean War where three million Koreans were dead, but fervent anti-communist campaigns and military dictatorships throughout the 20th century um, that in order, and that had to be a preset in order for it to actually open the 21st century with a bang as a nation rich and um, star power probably is not coincidental. Just as much as blackness can now just uh, represent the wound of the black man, 
uh, from the 19th or even 20th century. And, and that has now become, in Ashio Membi's term, a uh, signification of the cool, right? Past suffering of, of a blackness now transformed into, into a coolness. Um, but uh, signify a new signature of uh, uh, Koreanness to overcome is Han. Han is a uh, Korean term uh, that denotes the suffering uh, of the previous era in order to extend its power of enjoyable um, a Korean term, another Korean term, mat, that is um, fashionable trend and, 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 and cool uh, to the rest of the world today. Okay. I'm hoping, um, and, and this is, uh, I promise, the last thing that I'll say. I'm hoping to, um, in, in my study, and, and I will try to do it, you know, um, throughout whatever it is, 250 pages of my book, um, um, Hegemony Mimicry, not only scratch the surface of many of the films, popular cultural texts, and even songs that decode this opaque racialization of Korea's therein, but um, I am really uh, trying to figure out, and, and I try to continue uh, struggle with it uh, through my class and, and even uh, opportunity to present my lecture today, understand this uh, new, I think, 20th, 21st century racialized, again, consciousness uh, through the uh, rendering its, its racial identity opaque uh, that has become a signification of, of how you um, today. So thank you. Thank you. As it came to that, uh, tracing through all the terms in the country of different mimicry and various nuances that mimicry of voice is breaking. Did you have any open session for questions? Yes. The voice was a little breaking. Yeah. Can you can you carry on? I think I have a network issue. Okay. Are we audible, sir? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. One of the key uh, uh, aims of this seminar was to uh, look into the... Uh, we have a lot of consumption of Korean culture in terms of K-pop and Korean drama. That happens a lot in India, especially in our own state of Kerala especially so in the past one or two okay. years but there was not much research that was going into the uh, what what was the intercultural uh, things behind this korean uh, what they call uh, cultural uh, sudden there was suddenly there was a lot of korean cultures coming into uh, in, in our uh, you know in terms of k-pop and yeah. So one of the aims of the seminar was to uh, bring out all the aspects of it and look at it critically. Yeah. And I think your uh, talk has given the right code by historicizing the very aspect of Hellu in terms of the uh, bringing in uh, Baba's mimicry and it is something that Indians can also connect with because of the context in which the original essay was written. Sure. So yeah, and I yes. and I especially wanted to include that uh, for this uh, yes. lecture. Yes. So it's not the so right code, I believe, to the uh, for our seminar also. So thank you, so much for uh, that uh, deep historicization of the Hallyu phenomenon, and which is which I think uh, only an academician like you could do. We are only looking at the intercultural aspects of Korean culture in India. But what about Hallyu in Korea or in America, as you say? So I think that would be a right note that you have struck in our seminar. Thank you for that. Uh, so I also officially uh, opened this uh, session for the Q&A session.
uh, I would, we are welcoming questions from uh, we have participants uh, in the Google Meet as well as in YouTube. So you can okay. uh, type type in the questions from the chat box in Google Meet, or you can press the raise hand button in Google Meet and call out your names, and you can unmute and ask your question. We have about 15 to 20 minutes to take questions. So you can start right away. So let me just start uh, something. Uh, I have seen a lot of jubilation around the uh, test stocks, Oscar win, Parasite. But after that, there was a lot of uh, jubilation in terms of Korean Americans uh, being so happy about it. I have heard things, but after that, then I haven't heard much about what was happening. Uh, so within your talk itself, uh, I see a lack of uh, mentioning of even Parasite in the sense of it finally brings to, uh, so this is this is a momentous achievement. No? Parasite is a momentous achievement because this is the first time ever a movie, a foreign movie is getting the best yep. Oscar. It's, it's uh, okay. Circular coming back to something like what you are saying. So I would like you to comment on that if you could. Yeah, uh, I, I've actually uh, written quite a bit uh, on, on Parasite. Um, I didn't mention it uh, here, but it, it may be it may be an instance, I, I believe, of, of you can argue that you know Korea now is becoming a true partner of America, right? Uh, it's uh, it's probably not. After seventy-five years of, of being pro-American, right, ally, and 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 and, and, and partner, um, you know, a junior partner. Now it has been elevated a little bit in terms of the status. You feel right. Uh, finally, recognition, right? Uh, it's like uh, I don't know, uh, Samuel Rushdie being celebrated in Britain. You know that kind of a uh, that kind of moment, right? Um, you know, do you do you then? um do you then embrace it right i mean do you say wow you know 100 percent for sure are we now right um uh, recognized as a partner you know equal status or or are we still like hmm you know like is this uh is this just an honorary thing now that they're giving out right um because because we're so uh we've been we've been we've been so successful you know in 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 terms of is you know following this footstep right of of the Americans over the last 75 years. Um, and I think the truth is somewhere in between, yeah? Truth, you know, um, that that we have to embrace it and, and also be critical of it, right? Um, you know, it's uh, it's a recognition of some sort and, and it's a great achievement for Korean filmmakers that, you know, I myself included, um, you know, that I, 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 I accept it, you know, like Bong Joon-ho, has been a friend, you know, over the last 20 years. I mean, it's, it's uh, the writer director of, of Parasite. It's just a great thing, um, you know, to be now uh, perceived as the world-class, you know, um, director who is now honored by the U.S., you know, Academy of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of Film Industry. Um, but is it just also a tokenism, yeah, that is that being you know, being played out here is, is also another thing that we always have to, you know, consider as well. Not take it, again, blank, right, acceptance of, of the celebration. So, um, which, is, which is the same way I think uh, Squid Game has played out, right, uh, over Netflix. And, and you guys, I don't know in India whether you had the opportunity to watch, you know, Squid Game. It's but, quite popular. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, you know, it, yes, it's, uh, it made bi supposedly billions of dollars for Netflix, American company, right? Um, is it, uh, Ameri you know, it's great for Hong dong the the, you know, writer-director, it's great for Lee Jung-jae, you know, some of these people who, who uh, uh, you know, who've been around the Korean film industry for the past 20 years, it's great. Um, but how much, again, of that, you know, billion dollars that Netflix has made coming back to Korean, again, filmmaking is also, uh, and what kind of profit sharing, what kind of partnership, true partnership. And, and now, you know, it's a cap, you know, it's a world global capitalism, right? It's an era of global capitalism. So money talks. 
how much of that percentage is, is now being pummeled back, right, uh, to Korea, then now you can say is, is, is your, you know, Korean contest and Netflix as an equal partnership, yeah? We, uh, and, and a lot of the questions, more than eight answers are given, yeah, at this point. So um, it's, uh, you know, are, are we still, sorry, are we still entertainers, sorry. Sorry, just wanted to make sure that the house is not being burnt down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> While well, I'm giving a lecture in India. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the second floor is not burned down. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, so where was I? Yes, the uh, Squid Game and, and the, and, and you know, the is it still you know, Korean performers in the day of Shodan, in the days of 50s and 60s performing, right? Uh, in the interest of, uh, you know, American capitalists, you know, no, no longer military, right? But, you know, definitely, right? Uh, without, without, without reaping much benefits and profits, yeah? And there is no profit sharing kind of, again, uh, thing that is at stake here. So, so those are the things that I think, you know, firstly, you have to, you have to look, and, and interrogate, you know, for Koreans is a, not just for me, but, you know, for Koreans is a very important question. And, and secondly, uh, what, what are the codes and conventions that you can actually try to express, you know, uh, for things like BTS, you know, I mean, yes, I think, you know, um, you guys, I, I, I assume no BTS and, you know, like, um, you know, there's a lot of BTS fans also in India. Um, can can BTS continue to retain right their Korean even like their linguistic authenticity right the ways in which they can, you know because a pop music is all about I I feel it's not just about the rhythms and melodies but it's also about you know certain kind of linguistic expression right and 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 being able to fulfill right a certain kind of local right sensibilities that's that's what is at stake um, if can BTS continue to rap or sing, right, songs in Korean, you know? Um, and, or do they have to abandon it altogether and adapt, right, English language as its main, right, lang you know, um, uh, lyrical expression? Uh, that to me is a very, very, and, and to many others, very important question, yeah? Um, now the, uh, you know, six, of the seven members of the BTS do not speak English very well. You know, you, you know this. RM speaks English okay, but uh, you know, you ask Jimin to speak English, he's not very good. <laughs> you know, but now they are forced to learn. I mean, seven years after the Shodan troop, you know, kind of phenomenon in in Korea, you still have you know a Sugar Jimin. You know, forced to sing songs. I think you know sometimes they're uh, English like I. I I say this at the risk of you know being attacked by uh, BTS fans. Uh, you know, awkward their English uh, lyrical skills, and especially rapping English is is almost impossible, right? Even though they may try to mimic it, they try to approximate it as 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 best they can. You know, it's to me not there, right? In terms of its uh, articulation and, and poetic prowess. So, um, it. it then where do you say, well, um, you know, how much more do they have to do, right? In order to attain and continue to sustain their, you know, global power, yeah? Why not, why not try to go back in Korean, which they're a lot more comfortable with. Uh, they care, they're capable of composing and writing songs in Korean. With English, they have to get songs from you know British British composers and songwriters as well as American producers, songwriters, right? So in that an equal process of again cultural cultural innovation, you know, seventy years after they're still trying to even though their English is limited, still continuing to 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 
to write and, and mimic uh, English lyrics. Uh, and that to me uh, shows you the limited form in which Koreans have become partners, right? In terms of, again, global, global status and, and global uh, 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 output, cultural output that is uh, in some way still dominated by American. And, and um, yes, Korea has a little branch, but whether they can retain and legitimate their minjo, Korean national and ethnic identity, it, to me is, uh, is, uh, is questionable, yeah? So it continues to, I think, unravel in, in kind of, I think, complicated, yeah? Uh, colo you know, post-colonial status, yeah? And, 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 and to me, this is, this is a, a primary exemplary text of, of how uh, it's not fulfilled, it's be especially because given the, again, uh, uh, unevenness or disparities, yeah? That is involved there. Uh, let's take a few more questions. Sir, uh, like uh, Dr. Kim, I have this uh, Nee, I, I have this feeling that uh, like uh, it is like a, a kind of Asian visibility in the American theme. Like if you are, I mean, like if we do not actually limit it to reduce it to precisely South Korean identity, this would be like an Asian visibility on the American scene, which is not easy to come by actually. So mm -hmm. some kind of a, you know, there's a level in which all the values which BTS or other K-pop uh, <coughs> albums actually or music postulate, it is just like a lot of Asian values, which uh, is quite different from the way the West is looking at things. So that also is some kind yeah. of, a, uh, you know, a visibility for Asia yes. as a construct. Yes, I, I think I think in BTS, some, uh, and, and you have a lot, a lot of older, again, fans, it's not just young people, it's not just nine-year-olds who like BTS, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's like that in India as well. I mean, a lot of older fans, you know, when I go to these K-pop concerts in, in the U.S., uh, many uh, um, American, uh, older age Americans enjoy this music and their fans, you know. Um, you know, 40s and, and up, right? uh usually women <laughs> and it, it 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 there is a nostalgic i think recognition yeah recognition this is this uh, you know bts or you know k-pop reminds them uh yes uh, a certain kind of proto-asian harmony or wholeness yeah the values that you point out uh which is absent largely in in you know uh, american pop you know it's it's all about which I do like, you know, like I, I feel Kendrick Lamar, uh, American rapper, is, 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 is the best rapper, right, in the world right now. But, you know, he, he talks about, obviously, the, the, the slums of America, right, and the broken American ideals, yeah? Um, a lot of foul language, <laughs> you know? And so even though there's a lot of lyrical and uh, I think a lot of power that's associated with Compton, you know, Compton is a neighborhood, you know, black neighborhood here in Los Angeles. Uh, Broken promises America that is, uh, I think, you know, encoded in, in, in you know, Kendrick Lamar. Uh, the sense that, um, you know, uh, that's not that's not what some people need. Yeah, they need, you know, some some kind of again wholeness. Yeah, in in terms of the music the music people bring bring and and a, and a sense of again like integrity and harmony yeah rather than broken promise and fragmentation in the world and racial conflict right you know who needs blm banners everywhere you go right so um black lives matter that is so you know i mean that's that's the way uh some people feel and bts will now deliver that to you right and and even even though like I don't know Justin Bieber at one point may have delivered that you know when he was uh, adolescent you know youth 
he's no longer that. I mean, he's all tattooed up and, you know, drunk all the time. And, you know, he's going through divorce after divorce. So, so like, and losses after losses. So, so when you look at Justin Bieber, you know, like that's not the image that people need to be reminded of, right? Um, when they're, when they're, when they want certain kind of, again, remind their family values and wholeness. So, and, and, and BTS delivers it. But at the same time, you have to understand that there is a price being paid here. You know, it's not, it's not just all glory and fame that, you know, BTS and K-pop, as you probably know, you know, BTS not now, but, you know, suicide rate is really, really high, you know, and stress factor really, really high to cover up, right? That kind of wounded fractures and, you know, the, 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 the kind of intense competition and mental stress that many of these idols have they they camouflage it right uh and they don't show like you know members of the bts you know drunk you know on on social media ever uh but but it comes out at a certain point you know it comes out at a certain point and 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 it has a way of breaking you know i mean breaking uh, idols lives you know at some point which K-pop doesn't want to emphasize, but which, which which is now fabric of reality, right? In K-pop as well. Um, so uh, you you have to you know in in America, drug use and you know alcohol abuse and you know domestic violence and all of those things are part of the fabric of you know American pop. Yeah, people recognize it. In Korea, it's not part of it. K-pop is not part of that, but underneath right lurks that right discord and you know uh disunion and all of those things that that they constantly get masked which then has a way of you know exploding right in the form of uh you know in the in the case of big bang also all these like you know scandals dirty scandals and um that became uh, uh you know headline news as well as uh suicide and abuses yeah then later on, you know, that gets registered and, and, and people want to, uh, that shocks people. It's like, what happened? <laughs> you know, well, it's always been there. It's part of, it's part of idolhood that you just don't get here much. Yeah. When it comes to K-pop. Okay. Any other questions or? We have a question at the chat box. Uh -huh. Dr. Kim, am I, am I audible? Yes. Do you feel that the Hallyu wave might wane as many new trends are popping up? Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Vidya Mardin asked this question and she's saying that it's a very competitive world and she would like to know whether the Hallyu wave might eventually wane. Wait eventually out. what eventually way out as new trends are popping up oh wait um well i thought that um 10 years ago that he would wait but but my predictions were all wrong you know you know it's become even more more strong um it is it has become more powerful it's become more pervasive and you know it's just like everywhere now um i mean you used to be just one corner uh you know in america also you know it would just be one small segment that would be influential to american you know especially the youth now i feel it's gotten a lot more powerful a lot more pervasive and um and and uh it's uh it, it has a no I don't think it is coming down at any point, you know. Um, so I'm not going to make a foolish prediction again and say, "Of course, it's going to come down," uh, because I've been I've been proven wrong many times. Um, I think the power again has retained uh, because of the fact that um, social media uh, has become a lot more powerful than it has become, you know, twenty, you know, ten years ago or twenty years ago, obviously. Uh, and social media continues to cultivate and germinate, you know, the fanhood uh, to a to a level that we haven't seen ever before. That was completely unimaginable, you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. 
it continues to spiral into new fantasies, right? And and so K-pop has always been very good in creating cyber fandom, right? And has been able to communicate um, ever since, uh, because Korea has always been um, pioneering in terms of their tech, right? Uh, um, industry uh, and using that to, again, uh, disseminate and propagate their messages and, you know, continue to communicate with fans directly. Uh, and, and now there are games and simulations and, so, you know, social media based, uh, 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 like reality shows that they do that, um, uh, you know, fans only kind of, again, like, you know, uh, materials and contents. They continue to, I think, cultivate and expand their fanhood. So um, it's uh, it's it, it it has a it has, and then AI. I think you know, uh, artificial intelligence is another level in which you know um, many of the management companies and, and talent companies are trying to go to, which which Korea is going to have a real presence you know in the uh coming decades where this will be more dominant in, in global pop and so um i feel it's it's here to stay for a while uh it's here to stay for a while uh korean also contents in terms of again we all know especially during the pandemic uh streaming television has become a lot more popular than theaters worldwide and uh, that has a, had a way of, of increasing purchase power for Korean contents as well. Um, if you want me to talk more about that, I will. But, you know, let's just say uh, for, to, you know, the, for the sake of uh, time that, um, that it's, it's a lot more competitive in, in social media, right? Um, Korean, Korean. Uh, content that actually has a way of becoming dubbed very easily, right? Um, and uh, Squid Game was popular uh, in the U.S. not necessarily be through the subtitle version. I don't know in in, uh, in India whether you get you know the dub versions, but in 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 the U.S. many people watch Squid Game through the dub dub versions, yeah, which is which makes it more accessible. Uh, in theaters, you, you have a different experience, right? Here uh, in American theaters, you actually have subtitles, which is which limits this, um, you know, again, access, yeah? So uh, that's, uh, it has increased, again, the purchase power of Korean contents in the social media and uh, streaming television, uh, especially during the pandemic. And, and I feel um, it is it has become even more opportunistic, yeah? So... I don't think it's again to answer the question in a very long way. I don't think it's going to weigh in any time soon. We can take maybe yes, the, uh, one more question. Yes, Dia is my. Dia. Uh, hello, sir. Um, uh, I'm from Vyanad, uh, a small uh, district from Kerala. I would like I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, about um, I have studied uh, uh, about BTS and their uh, cultural influence in my uh, graduate uh, years, and uh, I would like to ask about whether their uh, influence have given a widespread influence uh, on the um, knowledge about. Korea and uh, their culture and their language and all the uh, all the things associated with it and uh, yeah uh, thank you for the question uh, yeah, they okay. have, uh, done, uh, uh, sorry I, I didn't finish and um, I think they have a very positive influence in um, uh, giving a widespread platform for the uh, Korean uh, 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 things and uh, culture to spread. Uh, is that correct, sir? Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I've been teaching, listen, I've been teaching a, a Korean, not Korean language, uh, but I do um, manage Korean um, language program here at UC Irvine. And, and UC Irvine is, uh, stands for 
you know, University of California, Irvine, and we were about an hour away from Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I've been teaching Korea-related contents and managing, you know, uh, supervising a Korean language program for the past 25 years here. Uh, believe me, um, uh, there has not just BTS, but K-pop, you know, I mean, before BTS, it was Big Bang and EXO, and before EXO, you know, it was HOT, you know, I mean, it, 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 all, a lot of these K-pop groups uh, have uh, generated uh, a clientele base for, for, for my classes and, and the Korean language classes. Uh, uh, when I first got here, there was only like maybe five sections, you know, seven sections that are being taught on, in Korean language. Now it's like 30, 40 sections, yeah? Um, where, where we got uh, the clientele of uh, Korean also changed dramatically. Uh, it used to be only Korean American students who would actually take these Korean, you know, mostly, mostly, not all of them, but mostly uh, Korean language classes and Korean content classes uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago. Now that has shifted, we have far more uh, diverse, right, uh, student population. Uh, and um, uh, they are Hispanic, Blacks, you know, um, uh, white, um, uh, you know, all walks of life. Uh, there is a strong uh, uh, South, South Asian uh, heritage students also, you know, um, as well as uh, Middle Eastern students, yeah, Middle Eastern heritage students so that, that occupy a huge, right, constituents in, 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 in our classes. Uh, so, and this is not just uh, University of California, Irvine, but you know, throughout the University of California system, California especially, uh, I think given the uh, ethnic diversity uh, the state represents as well as the proximity right, uh, uh, to Korea, that plays a factor, but um, they've been, uh, they've been uh, listening to K-pop, you know, watching Korean television, uh, <clears throat> not just dramas, but uh, you know, uh, comedy comedy shows uh, were very popular among these youth uh, for years, and so um, you know, uh, they uh, they would be uh, subscribing to these shows. You know, over YouTube, uh, I realized you know uh, at age thirteen through eighteen, and then you know once they get to college, they they want to know know more, right, about about K-pop and and Korean culture, and that's why they come to these classes. So it has it has provided, I think, an infrastructure. Uh, but as I as I've st stated, uh, there has to be, I think, not just analytical again understanding of, of things, but also historical and theoretical understanding of, of, of K-pop and, and K-culture. And that's, you know, been my, my uh, stance and approach to not just take these things on, at the surface level, but scratch it, you know, so that we get a little bit more density uh, to a way in which we can think about and conceptualize why it did the way it did. I mean, the, the biggest question that I a get asked, the number one question, whenever I go to uh, these talks, conferences, or, you know, a meeting with the media, people want to know why is it that this is so popular? And I say a very uh, short form answer of what I just did in the last, you know, hour or so. America, has been under the American, uh, Korea has been under the American cultural, military, and economic, you know, influence over the last 75 years. As intense as, as that influence had, uh, had, had been anywhere else in the world, to a point where the Korean elites had to learn, just like Indian elites had to learn English, you know, under, under British occupation, uh, colonialism, you know, over the last 75 years, uh, Korean at least had to, if you if you wanted to advance right in your career, um, business, um, politics, or even now to to a cultural right, um, if you want to see in those careers, you had to learn English, right? You had to learn what American, how Americans think, you know, uh, and you had to approximate that, right? 
And it didn't take just one generation. Uh, it took three generations of that, of that influence to uh, cultivate, germinate, and then, and then to blossom into what I call, right, the flowers of, of Hallyu. So it may feel that it is apolitical Hallyu. It's uh, not, uh, you know, exactly the most racialized kind of an experience. But underneath it all, right, it is that experience, yeah, is, is how I always begin by saying, I know, and, and people are like, why do you make it so complicated? And, you know, like, <laughs> so, but it's true. You know, there's no other way you can, you can, you can explain this. Yeah, you can explain this without recognizing the historical density behind K-pop, you know? It's not just like RM, all of a sudden watched all these videos and, and, and started learning English, you know? That's not how it happened. It has, it, it's, it's more layered than that, okay? <laughs> I hope that answers, Tia. Thank you, sir. It's very yeah. interesting uh, in the way which you said about uh, this com the opacity. That is a very interesting concept because we've heard about the relative transparency of colonial presence from Baba. Uh, Homi yeah. Baba speaks about that. And when you sp spoke about this opacity, you just took the entire trajectory and that is, that is wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping that uh, that uh, it, it would it would make some yeah resonance yeah over there, um, although we're obviously continents apart. <laughs> it did. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah, I was I was deeply impressed when you talked about obviously um, you know location of culture. You know, I mean, Baba Baba when you on, on a good day, yeah, <laughs> on his early good days, he he was he was uh, making a lot of sense to me, and I was trying to make application. Yes, it's a very different experience. Indian experience and the Korean experience, but there is an overlap somewhere, yeah? Uh, because the Korean experience is a, a little bit more different because it was, A, it wasn't, you know, direct colonialism, right? By Americans. And B, uh, Korea had already experienced Japanese colonialism, right? Before Americans came over, right? So it's a very different kind of an experience. Uh, but uh, when I was reading 25 years ago, uh, and you know, I was attending, you know, uh, Homie's Homie's lectures, uh, that um, that there was a lot of overlap that I could feel, yeah. And I I had uh, I had my teacher, Anu, uh, who's uh, who's of uh, Indian descent, uh, an English wonderful English teacher, uh, and she was the first one uh, to introduce me to. Uh, Homi K. Baba and Samu Rushdie and, you know, all these, uh, you know, um, uh, who else, uh, you know, Candace Balton speak, you know, this, these uh, seminal texts in, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Spivak, yeah, the post-colonial literature and, and criticism. I, I really got deep into that because uh, it spoke volumes to me and, and to bring it back to this, not only discuss how you, but but bringing it back to you guys, I want to get it. Wait. <laughs> Took me five years to find an audience <laughs> to, the, to, to my Indian colleagues, yeah? No. I think uh, we have had a good bunch of questions. Uh, there's more questions are there more questions I think we can take maybe one more okay sure Viju, i think asna km has raised the hand asna yes asna please speak up yes. hi professor uh it's actually quite an honor to finally hear from you because uh as part of my phd discussions uh, my supervisor had uh, advised me to read the Korean popular culture reader, and it's through oh, yeah. that that I came uh, to know about you. Okay. So it's quite amazing that I got an opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I was, uh, as a fan scholar myself, it was a little. It's a little difficult to navigate through social media, but 
uh, what I've noticed is, uh, in spite of a lot of Korean popular culture, especially K-pop, uh, taking on uh, a lot of media and a lot of media flows from Black popular culture, such as, for example, rap and jazz and uh, other forms, I have noticed that on Twitter, for example, a lot of K-pop idols are being called out for cultural appropriation of uh, certain black symbols, such as, you know, the cornrows. And it, it's a, it, it seems Correct. like such a complex relationship between Korea and African-American uh, yes. descent. So uh, I was wondering what your take was on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yes, as you, as you point out, there's no easy black and white answer, you know, to that question. Is it bad or is it, is it, is it, is it good? Is it wrong or is it right? You know, uh, I think it's, it's really somewhere in between. Yeah, you, you can't make that um, unless it's a very over form of, I think, you know, sometimes like black facing, you know, which, which uh, a couple of uh, K-pop idols did. Uh, did do and Korean comedians did do in the past, and you know, without without necessarily understanding the cultural cultural depth to it, um, it's really difficult uh, for us to provide what the salient you know kind of I think response to that may be. Uh, uh, YG again, you know, like YG is uh, headed by right the media module is uh, his name is uh, Yang Yeonso, right? Who used to be part of uh, Sateji. And, and the and the boys back in those days in the, in the 80s and 90s they were uh 90s uh, the biggest uh, uh k-pop you know they were the first probably arguably you know k-pop group and um you know they were involved in you know uh, uh 30 years ago this is uh uh, uh parodying and you, you know approximating as well as uh, as you call uh, appropriating uh black uh performances you know um quite a bit in the and that's how they became famous um in the in the 1990s now um did they did they uh, uh should they be called out for that you know i don't know i don't know i don't know what the right uh i think ethical um response may be any kind of i think cultural formation has to grow out of mimicry right i mean it's especially when there is such a such a hierarchical kind of relationship between american hegemony at the time and korean kind of experience that has to imitate it you know to 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 formulate his own legitimacy and um and uh at his infancy you know when when sateji and yang and the the father of yg when he was doing it when they were doing it you know, they were not necessarily being called out for it because nobody was paying attention to Koreans at the time. Uh, and that was, you know, I mean, it was, they, they really loved it, you know, that they were, they were, they loved the, you know, the black experience that uh, they didn't understand the historical, I think, density behind the cornrows. You know, cornrows is uh, uh, especially, especially uh, tricky because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the prison kind of again look, right? Which uh, incarceration among uh, black uh, men are, are especially high, uh, and it's not you can't just like go there without necessarily recognizing that there is a plight of blacks, obviously, you know, involved in it. But um, it uh, when again uh, nobody was paying attention to Koreans, uh, it wasn't called out for. Uh, but now I think. Uh, and that's where, you know, again, the Korean experience grew and, and, and YG and Sateji at the time, uh, uh, they were hanging out at the American military base clubs, you know, to understand the dynamics of breakdance and uh, choreography of African American, you know, they were hanging out with black soldiers in order to become in, in Korea, the pioneers of hip hop culture, right? Uh, and you, you got the first hand experience that way, uh, for better or for worse, okay? Um, you know that's what gave that legitimacy in some ways. Um, the, you know, the, if you if that thing travels uh, without the first hand contact, face to face contact, and mingling, I think there's a problem. You, if you only get it through social media or you know television, right, uh, which is worse. Uh, 
then then I think it can be a problem. But if you if if you're part of that kind of enclave of of a collective experience, hanging out with African American soldiers and friends, and you 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 become you can become part of the fabric of that social uh, movement or social culture, then I think you know you you're also staking yourself in it you know korea at the time and still to this day is part of pax americana right in in that way so uh which china obviously is not you know so um you can retain that i think you know to a large extent that cultural legitimacy now that uh i think you have 75 years of commingling with african americans you know um, Koreans have to learn better, and, and Tiger JK, who's uh, you know uh, uh, one of the early rappers, also would say the same thing uh, in Korea. Um, that 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 you have to understand again the historical again background to to a lot of these things, in order for you to claim a certain kind of a place, right? In that in that in that in that uh, um, circulation of culture. And so, um, especially now, there is no excuse. If you don't understand, you know, you, there's no excuse. A 19-year-old coming out and, and saying, I don't understand any of this. I'm just going to take what is at the crop, you know, like the, the, at the cream of the surface, and then just going to, right, appropriate this. You have to understand the historical gravity. You have to understand the density in which this was rooted from, and, and then maybe if at that point you're comfortable enough with it you know then you can do it right uh if not then you shouldn't so uh that's where i uh that's where how I, uh, that's how i would respond to you asna yeah yes thank you so much for uh, yeah. responding to that yeah yeah so i think we are just wrap this session up thank you so much for the uh, wonderful talk that you have delivered to us sir and thank you yeah, all thank for you. the engaging questions from the audience so now it's time for the formal word of thanks i invite the thank vice you. principal of Bizaris college Kote, dr jody Malpi, for proposing the formal word of thanks okay dr kim it has been an en a very enlightening evening i would say for us in kerala listening to you for more than an hour I, I think one and a half hours to, you know, uh, to the historicizing of Hallyu actually. Probably for that hegemonic and imperialistic uh, presentation of K pop. Because uh, now, as you were pointing out, here we notice the presence of K pop in the northeastern part of India at a time when they were trying to banish the so called. Hindi, which is supposed to be, I, I should say, uh, that language which tried to make India in a monologic one. So, yeah. so I think these are the various ways in which a cultural signifier can probably spark off diverse levels of explanations. So right from his historicization, we have taken through various levels of looking at the appropriation both through consent uh, and, uh, you know, uh, of coercion, consent, and every other method involved in the appropriation of K-pop. And it's been, I, I should say, uh, you know, we have thrown open a lot of channels. By the way, today morning we had a lecture, the session one, the inaugural speaker actually said that she would not like to call it as hegemony or a kind of colonization. So I'm I'm thrilled to have an entirely different view, a kind of uh, the idea of cultural hegemony coming up from the other side of the universe, you know, like, you uh, know. I'm definitely hegemonic. <laughs> <laughs> so, not it's, absolutely hegemonic, though. <laughs> yeah, so it has been uh, really wonderful to have a lot of hope ideas thrown open you know that is exactly what uh, uh, i think platforms like this should do so and on behalf of the department on behalf of all of us here at this part of india listening to you 
it is with open hearts and you know elated minds that we've been listening to you thank you sir for your wonderful presence and a very very lucid clear ideas of uh, you know approaching it from various angles it has been an enlightening experience thank you thank yeah, you very thank much yeah and thank you again uh for everyone uh involved in um you know making this a uh, you know experience uh, uh again uh, yes. very very productive even though uh, i'm just now waking up yeah yeah and so it was it, it's been uh yeah making yeah. me feel welcome although you know i i didn't have to i didn't have to take a step outside of my house um uh it's uh it's it's wonderful i mean you know uh this is uh uh yeah i think there's obviously a lot of things negative about the pandemic you know just just horrible things but um uh, you know if there is one little glimmer of light you know that it has given us is uh, this has become more familiar right the present presenting and and uh you know making making this global village you know reality so exactly exactly yeah. it's been a wonderful experience thank you one and all yes and it's been a long day i suppose oh uh, yeah i'm all just waking up here. but yeah you <laughs> woken up we're trying to sleep so, yeah so it's thank wonderful so much, au revoir thank you and uh, you know good night to one and all to all yeah. from the indian side and good morning to the the american side thank you Yes, and and any, uh, those of you who didn't get an opportunity or felt a little bit, uh, I don't know, shy, uh, you can um, email me at any point. You can, you know, it's all available. Um, if you Google my name, I'm sure you'll be able to get it. So I look forward, yeah, to a further dialogue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>